Okay, so um, I'm not sure exactly how many people have attended a Coaching the Female Athlete workshop with me or spent some time learning about that, but what I wanted to do was to go over some of the key things that we had gone over. And the purpose of today, and it's not just today, but the number of people that have been getting so engaged in this information around how to serve the female athlete, it was a great chance to start reconnecting with those people, the coaches, parents, and even some of the athletes themselves around what's this information like, um, how do we implement it, where can we come back with questions, comments, concerns, and with a great desire to create this coaching network around even though we might be in one sport, we might actually hear from other coaches that will help us um, learn from each other as well. This has all been built on the long-term athlete development pathway around this principle of, of doing uh, athlete preparation competition format in a meaningful kind of fashion with stage appropriate expectations for our athletes. And the uniqueness to this is what can we understand from our female athletes around in addition to basic long-term athlete development principles what kinds of things can we put into our performance environment and that performance environment being not only where your athletes come to train and learn but also the competition format what kinds of things can we bring in to those to make it uh, as good as possible to help each and every athlete become better and this has a huge connection to our athlete development matrix again these four pillars or components of athlete development these aren't unique these are understood globally around what does it take to build the athlete from the ground up and from a technical skills in the lower left hand corner would also include what are some of the tactics or strategies that might be used and to be honest this is often we recognize when we're, when we're dealing at a community or club level this is really where coaches focus a lot of their time and attention and we're learning that we would like to build out entire holistic athlete development moving up to the top left those physical capacities um, are we introducing our athletes to the right kinds of training at the right stage of their development? And not surprisingly, I think a lot of us understand in, this, in the youth sport world, way too often we are putting adult type principles and practices into our youngsters' performance environment. We're learning, unfortunately, from the downside that this isn't serving them well in the long haul. Moving over to the top right, that psychological mental skill foundation and the final one in the lower right hand panel these life skills which is around building social um, social intelligence social connection uh, emotional development cognitive development and so on and a lot of the, the pieces that start to come out of those life skills are surprisingly the ones that our athletes as they advance through the long-term athlete development pathway are not developed and are finding that those are getting in the way of athletes stay, continuing to be able to advance. So that's, that's where we're coming from um, around this particular coaching female athlete session. We also understand very clearly that despite all of the goods that sport quality sport can deliver, we're finding that the participation rates of everyone in sport, not just girls, but boys as well, continue to decline. The big four reasons are sport is costing too much money, costing individual families and athletes too much time. We also have an issue where many of our youth programs are no longer fun. And the final one is the issues around injuries. And I think when we understand why our kids are dropping out, then it does give us all an opportunity to examine our own programs. How are we doing? You know, does it really cost a lot for our kids to become involved and stay involved? This was an infographic that Cause and, uh, and some of the work that I was doing were looking at what do we understand about uh, the injuries in particular around female athletes. 
And these three terms might seem familiar to you from the session we had mechanical injuries. We focused a lot on the non-impact ACL injuries. And then we went into the energetic injuries, which were around uh, dietary intake or energy intake compared to energy expenditure. We talked about the female athlete triad and some of the consequences to the young female athletes reproductive function and if that starts falling off the wheels and that has impact on healthy bone growth and then the third one is cause uh, landed on the term emotional injuries but I was a little bit more fond of the term injuries of the heart heart in quotation marks that this is where many girls uh, and young women do not feel welcome or accepted within their programs um, and at this point, too, as we're flying through these slides, don't forget uh, if at any point you have questions. And I, and I would also invite comments as well. These are um, opportunities for you to give some type of comment around how have things been going for you and your program since the workshop? Did you go back with a different set of eyes and start to see things that perhaps you had not seen before or perhaps are seen differently for the first time? This was another key piece coming out around understanding some of the differences in competitive behaviors between girls and boys. We talked about the boys in that lower right part that oftentimes they would come out with effort first, leading to their performance, leading to acceptance within the team unit. And with girls and women, we see there's this subtle rearrangement that what ends up being that gateway to performance and gateway to engagement is through that acceptance arena. So does your performance environment create a place where every single athlete is valued? And valued not just for their technical performance, but that they're a valued member. And we understand that this is one of the reasons why many girls might choose to leave sport when they find other programs, other interests that do make them feel welcome. And if you can get that acceptance piece done well, then they will give you effort, um, unstoppable effort to be honest. I think if you can nail that acceptance one well, and that then will lead to the performance. Oops, sorry. And so the connection, acceptance, and at this point then again, I'm gonna just scroll through the acceptance piece, trying to again sort of remind you of some of those key features that we had gone through in the workshop. And if there are pieces that come up for you, uh, even questions of clarification. There might not be, there might be some questions that you would like to revisit again or open comments and um, that Aaron will be tracking those questions as they come in. Um, are there any questions at this point, Aaron? Not at this point, but we encourage everybody to go ahead and ask me. You can put them in the parking lot and when we have a break, we can address them. Wonderful. That's great. I am um, just having a little bit of trouble always finding my cursor, sorry. And then the skills, well-developed skill acquisition. I don't know if those of you that, again, attended the workshop, if you can recall that short video of the young nine-year-old girl going down her first 60-meter ski jump and this incredible conversation she had with her coach, verifying speed, uh, steepness, and what she's to do with her skis, and there was this exceptional calmness and a very high caliber conversation between coach and young athlete and that became um, again in, in some of the workshops just an excellent form of conversation and what I remind you here is that when we talk about a, a strong skill acquisition performance environment to remind yourself that it's not just about the technical execution you're not just teaching those technical skills or the tactical skills but that you need to be very intentional and deliberate around incorporating physical capacity skills. How are you informing them of mental or psychological skills? Do you include um, learning pieces, learning opportunities that allow them to develop their mental skills and then this life skills around creating uh, development of social connection and um, or cognitive, making good decisions. And I think this is where 
we again landed on a, on a very fruitful conversation around uh, cliques or cliques, as some uh, will pronounce, that these were well understood not to be very helpful either for individual and likely not for team performance as well. Oh, question? Yes. We have a question from Kevin. What is the primary thing you would do to enable acceptance to drive up? Great question. Primary thing to uh, drive to create acceptance? To enable acceptance to drive effort. To drive effort. So this is where starting to understand very quickly exactly where your athletes um, are coming at. And oftentimes this vision of acceptance will start to arise because of differences in technical skills and coaches can sometimes become overly influenced by the technical skills of athletes and that might lead to greater coach attention, greater coach feedback and so on for those that might be lacking in those skills. But if as coaches, if you can start to look at your athletes as complete athletes to understand that they don't come to you just as the executioners of technical skills, but what kind of physical capacities do they have? What kind of mental fortitude do they do they demonstrate? From a life skills, um, are they are they more of a workhorse? Are they able to create conversations with teammates? So that as a coach, can you find something to celebrate and something to shine a light on to each and every athlete? And then I think you as a coach then start to understand that these athletes come to you as as young and tired human beings and as you start to see that and value that from your perspective then you can provide your feedback you can make commentary about what you are seeing in those athletes and that you expand your own repertoire of feedback as a coach then, when your entire team starts to hear you give that feedback around, uh, for example, you really like the way that athlete A supported athlete B in understanding something more about the drill or helped with equipment pickup or equipment setup. You really like the way that they were able to comfort one of their athletes. When your entire team starts to hear that, they too will start to understand that they're being seen and valued for more than the technical skills. So hopefully that, uh, if that provides some clarity, I, I, I do like that question and again it, it often is about getting concrete examples and this is where I'm really keen to hear from you that um, in, the, in the session when I was talking about creating acceptance I was saying, no, this isn't about throwing red carpets and the dried rose petals and giving hugs and kisses to every athlete as they come into your rink or gym and so on. But it's about recognizing that they all have something to give. And as a coach then to be able to see that and honor it in a way. And much like as, as coaches, these are new skills for us as well. And to be able to practice those out much like our athletes aren't going to do new things well in the beginning, give yourself permission as a coach as well to try some of these things and see how it, see how it sounds to you. So, we have another question. Yes. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's around a group thing and, and a quick scenario. I know we'll maybe get to that a little bit later, but if you want to address it now or it can be later. Let's, uh, that is going to come up as a specific question. And uh, and so I will, if it's okay, we'll hold on to that, and then we'll we'll scoot through to the next one. Yeah. So I think this big piece around skills, and you're starting to get dialed in already around skills from a holistic point of view, uh, not just again from that from that technical quadrant. And the third one we talked about was around role models, and do you even introduce role models into your current performance environment? Uh, role models nowadays are um, are often found on YouTube. They're not very tangible. They're not often within our own community, within our own clubs. And one of the best pieces of advice is start to look within your immediate uh, vicinity, whether it's within a school environment, within a club environment, 
that those that are slightly older can work very well with those that are slightly younger if the coach believes in it. And this again, if it, this is very much important that the coaches value the importance of role models. In the workshop we talked about how classic role models right now are those that have uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Miley Cyrus twerking on a pole, um, that those become the role models for our young girls and they get terrifically mixed messages around am I an athlete or am I meant to be some type of you know, sexual icon bunny um, and those become very conflicting messages so if we can nurture role models then that those become invaluable and uh, that is uh, also uh, it's not expensive you're not flying anybody in you can create these as regular moments within the younger athletes' environments. And again, it takes cooperation across coaches. So to put this out um, as, as a request within your club, and, and I know with two ringette coaches in the room, um, that whether or not that becomes possible, but understanding that role models are effective about keeping girls into the game this serves not only the younger ones, but it also builds community within the sport itself. And especially for these younger ones, they feel, oh my goodness, this is right in front of me. And they actually get to see them. They might start attending some of the other games. And it also does wonders for the slightly older athlete. That they too, it's another indirect way of creating acceptance and value. That they think, yes, I'm valued for my contributions on the team that I play, now I'm also being valued by the slightly younger age group. Jerry? Yeah, I'm going to say we have to buy the drops. We met by far. We were most advanced in having a whole lot of people who are doing the Yes. And having girls go and help coach at home. We were most advanced in having a whole lot of people who are doing the work. Yes. That's it. That kind of That's it. Well, and I have two girls who are at the university. Yes, that's fabulous. That's fabulous. Right. Yes. So the, the, our group um, remotely is being, it's a little bit trouble to hear in a room. So could you repeat? Uh, I yes. What the, the, the message by, by Jerry's comment was? Yeah. So, very quickly, Jerry, who's, who's not only a, a nice hockey coach, but also a ringette coach, and in remark uh, or response to the role modeling, he was describing how ringette has really impressed him about incorporating um, female athlete role models. So, getting some of those younger ones who are either becoming assistant coaches or to come out and help with the younger teams as, as well. And and my familiarity with, with Ring It in the province as well as countrywide, that has become, I think, part of the culture of that sport. And I think other sports that don't do it naturally could stand to listen and learn and benefit from that understanding of uh, maintaining uh, the sports system. Because we know that the vast majority of participants in any sport are not always going to stay forever as the competitor, as the athlete. Very few of them are going to go on and be able to wear provincial colors, let alone national colors. And yet in order to maintain the sport system, this is the value piece. We value them for their efforts as being potential coaches, potential officials, potential sport administrators and volunteers for events. So this is where we build that out. Dave, did you have a, do you want to, to kind of expand or offer some information on that very exciting? We do understand a little bit of the difference between um, slightly older, that's more of a kind of pure player, player role model, and a larger gap is a coach or player type of role model where there's a certain amount of responsibility that someone has to hold. Yes. Versus, uh, you know, two years older. 
Mm -hmm. So there is a little bit of uh, thinking that has to go into that as we get adults that are sort of overseeing things. But yes, whether it's from the coach as a role model, female coach, female athlete, yes. or a slightly older athlete role model. So that's a slight difference for both of them. Yes, and so, so Dave, who is uh, uh, executive director with Ring at Alberta's raised a good point around the nuances of, I guess, di what different roles the role models are playing, not to be silly, uh, but whether or not they're actually a female coach role model as opposed to a player role model. And I think this becomes really fruitful ground for all sports to consider simply going back to your own performance environment, to your own club setting, and simply ask the question, what are we doing about role models within our sport in that variety of, of capacities that they, they might come? I've just come back, I've been asked to work with, with Rugby Canada on building their age grade uh, for a girls game. And this became a, a terrific focus point around creating role models within the game of rugby. And again, rugby has, um, I guess, it it battles with a lot of perceptions around is this a is this a sport for girls? Um, there's a lot of perceived aggression and so on, and hence the idea of what are all the different ways in which we can create positive role models in this sport. So again, I think there's a number of sports that are kind of resonating with this aspect around role models. So. The summary out of that workshop is shown for you on this slide. So the injuries, again, there's all kinds of things to tackle around um, preventing the mechanical injuries, uh, specifically around those non-impact ACL injuries, which we know occur at a much higher degree in the female athlete compared to the male athlete. The uh, energetic injuries and what I've termed uh, uh, injuries of the heart, and then the implementation, which we just went through around acceptance, skill acquisition, and role modeling. So um, this now is, is truly um, our open-ended period of questions. Uh, we've got a, just about uh, 30 minutes left. And we can now start to address some of the other questions. Um, but for those people that don't have a specific question. I'm, I'm on this slide. I've got sort of three thought points that I'm really curious around. How has this been going for you? One of the ideas and aspirations I had from creating this regular kind of connection with coaches around coaching a female athlete is to um, is to find genuinely how is it going? Are you are there things that are working well for you? Are there continued challenges and barriers um, that you might be uh, running up against that we can try to work through collectively through the province as well? So the question I've asked here, has anyone added an ACL injury prevention program uh, in, in, into their repertoire? Um, I had mentioned this get set it's a free app uh, produced from uh, the Oslo Sports Science and Norwegian Sports Science School on behalf of the IOC. This was a set of videos and exercises. So if we could maybe tackle comments around this question that's up on the slide in front of you, as well as Aaron's got some other questions that might be coming in. So if you have responses to this one particular question, again, you can add your comments uh, into the question box. And perhaps, Aaron, you can speak to those as they come in around the responses. We have one question in regards to the app. Um, John, uh, Dean has looked at, at it, and it, the, the FIFA app is it's for plus 11, and the FIFA plus 11 was for the coaching plus age group. Is there any something? It's now, around the age group, sir. Now, was that the Get Set app? Or was that because I, I'm not familiar with the FIFA app? No, it was the FIFA Plus 11. Okay. So this one, if I can... Um, I don't know if I can show it to you on... Uh, 
Um, put up, put up. Yeah. Wait, can you see me? So there is. <laughs> there we go. So this get set app. Maybe I'm going to go into the settings uh, about this app. And I can send this out. This is one that, uh, so when all of these ACL injuries started to happen and be documented, first of all, it was, it was incredibly shocking to find that female athletes were suffering from these non-impact ACL injuries anywhere from about three to eight-fold higher compared to their male counterparts. And that was uh, when we compare within the same sport uh, at the same competitive level. And the Norwegians have been world leaders in this, and not only finding out what are the factors resulting in uh, why is this happening, but they were also voracious around finding some ways in which this can, can be uh, repaired or prevented. Now, we know that there are some uh, factors that cannot be changed or modified, but what they found was a big factor was around these neuromuscular balance issues that can be modified and have led to 50 to 80 percent reductions in these non-impact ACL injuries and these programs then became tested over time and were, you can't, you can't not incorporate it. And I've said this even to those sports that feel that they might be a water-based sport and so jokingly I would say, look, your athletes aren't amphibians, they do actually walk on, on ground and if we're looking after the entire athlete, then this becomes incredibly important. Um, and from this, then, the, uh, it will be listed again by sport. And again, this isn't all the sports that I'm showing up on the webcam right now. And within each of these will be shown, you can also get locked in or drill down into different body parts. And within each of these, if I just click on the shoulder right now, it will have very short easy to see videos that can be used on, on any type of technical device. And I know some places um, where they might be able to show these on a screen, uh, some gyms right now, I'm impressed how well equipped they are that these can be shown, but these also become easy for the athletes themselves. And we know that this generation of athletes are incredibly connected to their own technological devices. So this is the Get Set app from the Norwegians, which again, I think is, uh, I guess it's as good as it can be used. So that was a bit of a long-winded answer, but this, this was not the FIFA 11, which to my knowledge is still only out in print format. Just a comment, um, sometimes the app was felt like it was more for older girls. Do we know of any resources that were more pertinent to the, you know, the 12 and under age category? Excellent question. And most of the research right now has been, um, has been examined in those girls that are probably 10 and over. And yet I would say that the coach that is comfortable in viewing these exercises to look at suitable modifications that would be acceptable for those slightly younger age groups. And when we think about the variety of movements that we are asking our young female athletes to engage in, you can use this Get Set app to look at those different kinds of exercises. Now, having five and six year olds perform planks for extended periods of time, I think is a bit foolish. I, I just think that there are younger those certainly probably six and under benefit most from absolute free, wide-ranging activity. Um, one of the, this is a bit of a sidebar, but related, I think we get so worried about what kind of structured programs we're giving our very young ones that sometimes what we need to do is less. We need to let them get out there and be that free-range chicken and go and explore things with, without adults. Um, from 
a mobility point of view and sometimes learning uh, what can be very fun with the younger ones, five and six, are some of the balance exercises, which can be built into really fun games where it's, it's almost like those one-legged rooster fights, so you stand down and you're trying to push somebody over. Uh, those can become very fun kind of games. Um, I agree with you. I think um, drilling this down into the younger ones, I would have to say at this point, it would be up to the, the creativity and of the coach to be able to modify those for younger athletes. Any other questions? I'm going to throw up this other one. Any other comments on the ACL piece? Uh, or This is a general comment. Uh, watching uh, girls be, doing squats, a lot, of the, a lot of the girls are having trouble with the knees bending. So how do yeah. we, how do yeah. we uh, fix that? Yeah, so Again, if um, so, the whole notion of squats uh, and what girls will typically um, can typically demonstrate is this what they call it valgus. Uh, the, the, the sort of slang name for it is kissing knee disease. Is that any time a girl comes down landing from a jump or uh, goes into a, any form of a squat position, the knees have a tendency to collapse in. And that is a technical piece. They need to actually be trained how to land. And this is where early introduction to gymnastic type tumbling, gymnastics has some of the best foundational skills to teach children how to land in a jump. So that, I remember my own kids going through it about landing and jumping like they're riding a motorcycle. And they become mindful of how their, their feet and knees are positioned. If you have any girls in your program, if you're doing squats with anything else other than a broomstick before they can demonstrate appropriate technique, um, adding additional weight to a poor technique is an accident waiting to happen. And so there's, we can, we can apply resistance training as long as the technical execution is exquisite. We never ask any additional, uh, other than their own body weight, or as I say, literally a broomstick, before technical execution is perfect. And that goes along for whether it's a squat, a dead, deadlift, um, jerk and clean, and so on. We get the technique down so that the body mechanics are what they need to be before we start adding weight. Good. Okay, I'm going to throw up another question here. Um, the energetic injuries, and I know this again became quite, um, it was a fascinating conversation as we were talking in uh, around energy balance and the consequences of negative energy balance leading to changes in menstrual or reproductive function and that leading to negative bone health. And this created quite a conversation among many of the coaches because there was this understandably huge discomfort around thinking, oh, we're talking about their menstrual cycles. What has this got to do with them and their performance? And, and yet, as we understand the role of positive fueling habits, that this does impact athlete health. And so it becomes one of these other issues, kind of like the non-impact ACL injuries, is that you can't unknow what you know now. You can't unsee it. And so can we start building more comfortable environments to talk about positive fueling and its relationship not only on their athletic ability, but also on their overall health and wellness. Um, when I was in Airdrie, there was actually, and, and it was hosted from the Alberta Sport Development Center. Uh, Reed Bilbin and his crew had sponsored a, or hosted a session in Airdrie at the Genesis Place. And there was this wonderful discussion talking about, can we start talking about good fueling practices without it being hung up in dieting and body image, and yet it becomes a critical piece to the building of, of female athletes that they understand uh, that they are, they're like a, a performance machine, like a Formula F1 car, I sometimes say, 
And how can they learn to fuel themselves so they can train well, so they can compete well, so they can build themselves well? And then if those issues come up, because some sports might be more susceptible to girls and young women taking away the food they eat because they want to change the way their body looks or, um, or moves or how much it weighs, can start creating opportunities to open conversation with that. So we, again, we didn't have any hard and fast answers, but we know that this is a critical issue for young girls who, again, most of their existing role models right now are giving very negative messages around what their bodies need to look like to be accepted, not only within their social context, but even within their sports circles. Anything coming up here? Not just that part of my question. Okay, all right. And I know that remains a, uh, in fact, it was something that I know Airdrie was talking about. How can we maybe get coaches and parents, perhaps even some of the, the younger athletes, into a room to talk about the importance of positive fueling. And I, I deliberately use the word fueling practices. I want to change the, uh, the baggage that is typically associated with dieting, uh, nutrition, even Canada's food guide. Bless its heart, it tries to do a good thing. But not many people can kind of pick up on the nuances required uh, for, for growing and developing young female athletes. Any, any uh, uh, resources you can recommend online for the group about positive fueling? Uh, yes. Um, there was one that came out. I think it was, do you remember it, Aaron around the Coaching Association of Canada came out with Sport Nutrition? Yeah, yeah there's, there's some excellent resources there. Yeah. Um, not quite sure exactly. And if I could just ask clarification around the, the type of resources, um, can you can you just uh, can you describe in a little bit more detail what kind of information you're looking for? Positively, is there a risk associated with the energy drinks and the bombardment of marketing on our young athletes oh, gosh. in that direction? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's such a good point. When we talk about role models, I mean, there's a lot of information coming out right now around things like those energy drinks, which uh, don't improve performance. They, they certainly help the marketing companies get more money into their budgets because they are now marketing to younger and younger children, including athletes. Um, there is... Uh, and this is where I think sport has this great opportunity to create a different, um, a different perspective and to equip the young athletes as well as their families around what is truly positive to uh, promote um, healthy habits for the young athlete. And that is, um, so defending against the marketing uh, what I'll do is when we get those people that have registered for this, I'll make sure that we can post that as well, certainly on the Alberta Sport Connection website in connection to these. And so we'll make sure that we get some additional links to other information. But this is, if we put information up and you look at it and you kind of go, ah, you know what, that really didn't hit the spot, let us know. Let us know. And because we do have access to a lot of different areas, and then we can keep trying to find something that, that might be of help to you. Perfect. Yeah, the, the question is more about uh, generalities, magician do's and don'ts, and what not to eat and what to eat. So we can certainly do that. I had another question from Chris. Mm -hmm. um, great question. Any negative impacts to boys if we use the model for coaching girls? Uh, acceptance, after performance, etc. Do you think traditional, typical male-centric practices can change and potentially accommodate all kids, especially for career teams? Yeah, that's a, boy, that is a dynamite question. Well done, Chris. Thank you for that. Is there a downside? Uh, no. Um, is there a recognition, though, that 
Again, the, 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 the difference in the sequence going back to that one where with girls it starts with acceptance and the boys it starts with effort, those are general findings. Um, I know this will come up sometimes where, say under the age of 12, most sports can be trained and uh, competition formats can actually be co-ed. Much to the chagrin of, of some parents, they think uh, in particular, one side or the other is not being served well when they're in a, in a mixed audience. Anyway, uh, generally speaking, there's, there's no either physiological or psychological reason why girls and boys can't train or compete together, but it's, it's, it's the social context. So many times parents think it shouldn't happen, and boy, if parents think it shouldn't happen, then the, ki the kids get afraid too, and coaches can, can carry those as well. So from a, a co-ed perspective, uh, the idea of the term coming out now is, is a bit of a, of a tribal mentality, so that if we are all part of the same tribe, boys and girls, what are the, what are the goals that we are aiming for? And how do we behave within a tribe in order to ensure that the tribe advances? And so if we are, I know in uh, alpine skiing, for, for example, boys and girls will train together, and they're all part of the same tribe, so to speak. And how can we create an environment where it, it is the, each and every member has a duty to the tribe or to the club to make it a very positive training environment? If a coach is sensitive to that and they see some behaviors arising that boys are not appreciating the girls of the team or the girls are misbehaving around the boys, it does become the coach's responsibility to shine a light on it and find a different way to again regroup around tribal mentality. Uh, if there is, so that kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I've hit the nail on the head around this one, but around is there a downside to addressing the, did I get close to that one, Aaron, or did I drift? Yeah. <laughs> response to direction. I think we got it. Okay. And, and I should also say that even though we're kind of capturing this in, in a, in a one-hour time frame, um, it, I, I never mind people sort of emailing me afterwards, and I know I've got Tyler's uh, from Sport for Life. Uh, if there's other questions and comments that continue to emerge out of this, keep the questions coming. I'm I'm happy to get back to you, and you know we can arrange a little chin wag or conversation as a sidebar. But please feel free to do that. Um, the last question I have in in this box is around: Have you noticed? Uh, any cliques on your team since the workshop, and I know many of the, the attendants at the workshop, uh, many of them recognized that there were clique or clique behaviors. Um, and it was kind of scary for some, thinking, oh my goodness, you mean I've actually got to go and do something about this? Um, and, and again, it's not, a, it's not an end of one engagement. It's like, oh my goodness, if, if you see it, now you've got to attend to it each time. Uh, recognizing that it's it's not it's the exclusion it, it's the exclusionary behavior of a clique that makes it so devastating for any type of tribe or group and so uh, if if there's any coaches that have noticed cliques in a different way since the workshop and if so has anybody tried to initiate any dialogue I mean this is a, a big piece that I think a lot of coaches would be super keen to hear about. So, anything coming in there? Uh, yeah, a good question from Greg. How would you go about building an environment of acceptance in a group that has begun to develop threats and bullying, especially for the attacks about body? And how would you open up a discussion for female athletes about this? Okay. Um, wow, that's... Uh, <laughs> I feel like that would be... Uh, Okay, so, I mean, it's an awesome question. It's, it's huge. And I would, I would say if we could kind of revisit the piece of, uh, around skill acquisition and the athlete development matrix, 
So if we start to see the different contributions that athletes make, not again just in that technical quadrant, but really start to see who they are and what they are building and growing on in all components of the athlete development matrix. So technical, physical, psychological, and in those all important life skills around um, social communication between one another. And if you as a coach start to see that and then you can speak to those attributes within the athletes, you become one of the most important managers of the culture of your performance environment. And then if you are seeing that in athletes, because not all athletes are going to come with exactly the same resume or the same exact profile. And in our younger sports, and I don't think anybody does this deliberately, but as coaches, most of, most of them are, are well-meaning, generous volunteers. We're not all trained professionals in the area of, of coach, um, coach provision. We're doing the very best that we can. And many times we do become fixated on that technical, tactical component. And we seem to think that when an athlete is doing the technical side of their program or of their sport very well, that we bestow a lot of other acceptances um, and riches on the other parts of them as an athlete. And it's so I encourage coaches to look at your athletes holistically across all components and be able to in your own, uh, whether it's in your mind's eye, to be able to identify where are my athletes on their long-term athlete development journey. And this is embedded in a sports athlete development matrix which again is, is coming for some sports. Dave can probably comment specifically on this because I've been working with Ringette Canada on their athlete development matrix and that is intended to help coaches know what to look for in their developing athletes. And girls in particular love the exercise of goal setting. And so then if you can introduce to your entire team or club the sense of goal setting, do they have goals in each and every component of athlete development? So they might have some fixed technical goals. Do they have some physical goals? Do they have some mental or psychological goals? And this all-important one that we none of us really do particularly well, goals within life skills, which include ability to make decisions, ability to communicate or support my teammates, ability to have another teammate support me. When we start to speak to these, make them more tangible from the eyes of the coach as well as for the athletes, I think these become important good steps. There? So, um, along the same lines, another question from the parent parent perspective. So, um, I've noticed clips on my child's soccer team, U12, it seems the coach actually encourages this by playing the same kids together on the same line to exclusion of those kids that are not considered starters. As a parent, I would like to see a change, but as a coach myself, I try to leave coaching to the coaches. Mm. Yes. Wow. What age group again? U12. U12. Um, heartbreaking. Again, I'm, I, I would love to say that that is the, uh, the rare occurrence. Unfortunately, it is all too common. Um, I would say making changes can be, um, well, first and foremost, I think playtime. Playtime becomes a critical issue for any type of team sport and that those kinds of issues and conversations are best had at the beginning of the season about having the coach declare quite openly what is their approach to playtime. And if there are coaches that can have an awareness about the importance of uh, equal playtime, which I believe for the 12 and under um, should actually be the case. Um, whether or not there are clubs that actually 
put that into any type of policy statement. Uh, coaches that do not comply with, uh, with equal play time um, or equal opportunity to develop, then um, if they are publicly saying that to the entire parent group or at the time of team selection, look, I'm here just to pick the, the, the best possible players and I am always out to play my best players. Because really what that is saying to everybody, the coach is saying, I am here to win. And winning is what is most important. Well, from a youth development point of view in sport, we understand that this overfixation on winning is one of the issues which is killing children's engagement in sport. So we're not going to make those changes whole, uh, wholesale very quickly. And yet, if you ask the coach to express what is their philosophy around playtime, then as a parent, then you get a chance to pick another team. Um, if, and, and again, I know if friends are involved or if transportation to and from is involved, that's not as easily done. There might be, depending on, I'm assuming if you, you yourself, you're the parent on this call, you're involved in sport, and as those who have a little bit of role with all around coaching, it's difficult to have those conversations with another coach because uh, you don't want to come in like you're the know-it-all and you want to leave it to them. And yet, if there is an opportunity to have that conversation with the coach without it becoming inflamed, I would say it becomes an opportunity to inform them around what possibilities and opportunities will emerge with equal playtime and that the lack of equal playtime actually gives the, the rooting for cliques and exclusionary behavior. So again, kind of a, uh, I hope I didn't do that one ass backwards on you, but um, did that kind of help? And like I say, if, if the, the, this one is so near and dear to my heart, this is also one that I'm more than happy to have another sort of sidebar conversation at another time, if, if that's of help to you. Maybe we can just lead into our question of before since we're on the same topic, is how do, so how do we mitigate that? How do we mitigate the group thing or the group types and errors in the team environment in order to create acceptance? If there's any overarching thoughts you want to leave us with. Uh, one concrete one is is with the cliques, and, and again, when you are looking at scanning your club, scanning your team, scanning your players or athletes for clique behavior, it's not so much that you're trying to interfere with whose best friend is who. You are looking for when that becomes the exclusion of others, and it's when those unions then start to exclude other teammates so they never do a drill with anybody else. They never uh, want to share with anybody else outside of that. So it's important to note that within yourself. It's when it becomes exclusionary, that's when you want to be able to come in and do something. A concrete uh, application to this is the way in which you run your training sessions. And if you create training sessions where they might be able to self-select their teams or their partners or, or threesomes, whatever they're doing around drills and skills, but then as a coach, you can modify that so that you make changing the membership of your small-sided games and drills, you build that in. And you, don't, and you do that repeatedly so that they might know they might get their first choice, but then every 30 seconds, every one minute, you are switching partners, you are switching the progression of the drill, and so on. The other part um, is that, and, and again, I think when a coach has an equal playtime philosophy, the, the whole team, including their parents, start to understand that, that every single person matters, that there is value given to every young athlete that is on this team when the actions are consistent with the words of the coach. So th those become things to look for in yourself as a coach. Um, the, the other part, I always think at the beginning of any season, the parent conversation that you might have, we often have parent meetings and so on, or parent handouts, is that 
we get a chance to have that open conversation with when the types of exclusionary behaviors emerge, what are you going to do about it as a coach? And so you can express to the parents that it's important that we all, all 20 of us on this squad, even though not all 20 are on the field or on the race at the same time, we're creating this positive performance environment and that you will be encouraging them to often train and compete on different lines, different positions, and so on. And then the third one is to actually have that conversation with the girls themselves. Uh, I would say nasty clique behavior usually doesn't mature, well, it can emerge under the age of, of 10, but typically the, those, those negative clique behaviors really start to become fine-tuned after the age of 10. So if you're dealing within that age group and you feel like you're already in the midst of it, then certainly having a, um, a, a team conversation about how is, how is everybody connecting to a particular um, goal of the team and without calling any individual out specifically to remind everybody that we are an entire team and it's not just who's, who's on, again, on the rink playing at the time. So those are just like a, a few places to address within your own culture, conversations with parents, and conversations with the squad. Oh, it's time. Okay. Um, gosh, it did go quickly. So the last slide, just to show you um, any further questions and comments, Tyler at the Sport for Life office has been uh, more than happy to um, be the point person. Um, I would say that um, also I will send out on that Alberta Sport Connection link um, my own email address if you wish to connect and also to gather up some of the other uh, resources. So I am, any final comments or we can, the, the questions that have not been addressed? You guys can all email me. Um, I'll put it in the chat box. Aaron.Lavarado at AlbertaSport.ca and we'll be sure to get those answers uh, for you. No, and are they seeing the chat box or do you need to put it in the question? I will put it, I'll put it in the question box right now in my response to one of the questions. That's great, thank you. So I'm mindful of time, I'm, I'm always, uh, I want to promise that we're, we're never going to go over the hour because I want people to uh, come back for the next hour when we have it in, in February. So I am so grateful for everybody being here, um, both remotely as well as here at Percy Page. I look forward to uh, staying in touch with you over this, and thank you again to Tyler at Sport for Life for hosting the platform, and as well for Aaron being uh, incredibly great on the, on the laptop beside me, keeping all the questions coming in, and, uh, and people that have stepped out on this chilly day to come here. So thank you again. Uh, I look forward to staying in touch and really grateful for everybody's uh, uh, interest in this. It is a, uh, a very pertinent area. I uh, look forward to seeing you and hearing from you in 2017, if not before. Thank you. Thanks, Vicki. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.